Uh, can I thank everyone that's logged on to hear these announcements today? It, it is a great privilege to address you, even though, of course, it is uh, through the internet rather than face-to-face -to, -face, uh, to announce a new chapter in the management of our most important river system. Now, at the outset, I'd like to recognise the new chair of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority uh, and other members, of course, and Sir Angus is actually joining me here in Canberra. I know that you can't see him, but I can guarantee you he's here. Uh, and Sir Angus Houston has already made a formidable contribution to Australian public life during a distinguished military career, and I look forward to working with him in his new role. Also, I'd like to especially acknowledge Robbie Sefton, who, along with a panel, undertook the independent assessment of social and economic conditions in the Murray-Darling Basin that I'm also releasing today. The assessment was a huge undertaking, and its findings and recommendations have been critical in my consideration for the past four. Now, Robbie and the panel spoke to many hundreds of people across the basin during their work. This was a massive undertaking, and I want to congratulate Robbie for the thoroughness of her work and that of the team. Today, I'm also releasing the first review of the Water for the Environment Special Account, which was undertaken by Sally Farrier and her panel. Ms Farrier is a former National Water Commissioner, and while I'm sorry she isn't able to be with us today physically, I am pleased she's able to join us virtually. Now, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge some of my parliamentary colleagues, all of those MPs and senators from right across the Murray-Darling Basin, who have been, and will continue to be, fierce advocates for their communities. But I would like to single out Damien Drum, Ann Webster and Tony Patton in particular for their contributions. Uh, three individuals, I have to say, that don't hold back when it comes to forthright advice and feedback. And they certainly provide that on all matters related to the Murray-Darling. And that has contributed significantly to some of the decisions and policy announcements that I'll be detailing shortly. So thank you to everyone that's joined us online today and for your interest in this very important subject. Now at the heart of what our government is doing, and a response to the reports is a commitment to put communities back at the center of water reform in the Murray-Darling Basin. It has been nearly a decade since the Murray-Darling Basin plan passed through the parliament with bipartisan support. It has been a significant and challenging reform. Nevertheless, significant progress has been made toward our goals. Nearly 2,000 gigalitres of water per year is now being used for a healthy working river system on behalf of the Australian community. This means that of the water recovery required to meet the sustainable limits in the Basin Plan, well over 95% has already been recovered. The heavy lifting has been done. The reality is that though through a lot of hard work, we are very close to the finish line on this important national reform. And I do appreciate that within this reform, there are unavoidable and very real competing interests. Farm to farm, region to region, and state to state. So I think it's worth recalling the speech made on the 25th of January 2007 by former Prime Minister John Howard. It was actually the catalyst for the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Crucially, the former PM then talked about water and the economy and the need to have a national approach to water security for our most important river system. Now I agree with those sentiments. And my speech today is not just about the original plan, but about water management in general. Now, when John Howard announced his national plan for water security in 2007, times were very different. Australia's prosperity, though hard fought, seemed assured. And the global financial crisis wasn't yet a gathering cloud on the horizon. But that plan was also announced, like now, against the backdrop of the nation experienced a terrible drought. If we fast forward to 2020, we're living through the COVID crisis and the associated and unprecedented hit to our economy locally, nationally, globally. This crisis in Australia and the world has impacted a scale that were completely unforeseen. Couple this with years of drought and a savage summer of bushfires, and you have an unprecedented triangulation of challenges to our robust nation. Because of this, our focus must remain firmly on jobs and looking after our communities, while also being good stewards of a healthy river system that benefits everyone. To successfully recover from COVID and drought and bushfires, we must grow our economy in this incredible food bowl we call the Murray-Darling Basin. And growing that food and fibre in Dorothy McKellar's land of droughts and flooding rains, rather than William Brake's green and pleasant land, presents different challenges. 
Now, the approach I take to this job will be a little bit different to my predecessors. This is not a criticism because water policy is a notoriously complex policy area. But I'm a practical guy and I take that practicality into my role as a minister. I'm born and bred outside of the basin. I've been a farmer, I've bought and sold water, I've been an employee, an employer, I'm an electrician by trade and an engineer by profession, which means I look for pragmatic, phased and sensible solutions to issues and problems. And I also take John Howard and Labor's Tony Burke at their word when they said the plan that we have been bequeathed is adaptive and able to be changed to suit the economic times and the variability of our weather. And our rainfall is indeed highly variable. And the deviation around average annual river flows in many parts of the basin can be enormous, which is why we do need a plan that is adaptive to the needs of a variable climate and to economic changes. And to cite one example, in 2007, the CSIRO estimated that by 2020, average annual inflows could decline by about 15%. What we've actually seen over the past 20 years is annual inflows that are in some places almost half that, well, that we saw in the previous century. In 2018-19, some catchments, like the Macquarie in New South Wales, received only a third of what had, up until then, been their lowest inflows on record. So across 125 years worth of records, more than half of the driest years have happened in the past 20. Now this is not about preparing ourselves for a future with less water. We are already living it. And recent reports such as the Kelty report have confirmed this lived reality. Now having said that, we have seen some encouraging rainfall across many parts of the basin, which has allowed some good winter crops to be planted. Now there's by no means drought ending everywhere, but the figures and the outlook do offer hope. Now, the current volume of water held in storage in the Murray-Darling Basin is up by more than 3,300 gigalitres, or 32%, than at the same time last year. The last few months have each seen the best rainfall for a number of years in many cropping regions, and the outlook from the Bureau suggests that we are going to see a wetter than average spring. Well, let's hope that's what we see. It's for all these reasons that today, I'm launching an action plan to refresh our commitment to the future of communities in the Murray-Darling Basin. My focus is squarely on increasing the efficiency of water use in the system, including for the environment. I want to rebalance the system and not just through the blunt tool of water buybacks. In the words of the National Farmers Federation, as we progress towards the last phase of the plan, we need to adopt a pathway of least impact rather than inflict more pain on those who have paid a heavy price for reform. Now, while some farmers have done well out of water buybacks, and river health gains have accrued to all Australia. For some irrigation communities, it has been a net negative. When you take water out of a town that was built on irrigation, there are significant consequences for those communities. Now, this message is very clearly spelt out in the Sefton report, and the government has heard the community's message loud and clear. Therefore, the cornerstone of the measures outlined in the action plan I launched today is to put an end to water buybacks. This means shifting the focus of the water efficiency program to all farm projects, not farmers water licenses. It means ensuring that projects that replace 605 gigalitres worth of buyback succeed. Now these projects must be flexible and they must have community support. Secondly, I'm announcing funding for new projects to put money back into communities that have been adversely affected by water reforms. And thirdly, I'm making changes that will inject trust, visibility, and accountability back into the institutions that supervise the river system. Now, in regards to the Sefton report, I've already acknowledged Robbie Sefton is with us today. And as Robbie has said, the process was much more listening than talking. And that is the approach that informed the panel's reports and recommendations. Now, I've used the recommendations to inform the investment package I'll explain shortly. Some of the recommendations are outside of my portfolio, so I'll be working with my ministerial colleagues to respond to those in due course. But I want to highlight two very important outcomes of the panel's work. Firstly, what they found. Water reform and the challenges around it have driven a growing community distrust of all levels of government. The need for long-term commitments to grow regional economic activity, the need for better data when it comes to the basin's water resources, and the need for more flexibility when it comes to water recovery. 
The second and perhaps far more important lesson is how they went about their work. Communities were put at the centre. The panel listened to more than 750 people who took time to attend face-to-face -face meetings and to neighbours, acquaintances and people who stopped them in the street after all panel members were drawn from the community. They took into account the 600 survey responses and the more than 170 written submissions. Now, a line from the report that stuck with me was that communities have lost trust because they feel over consultant and under listened to. Now I've visited a number of communities across the basin now, despite the challenges of COVID-19. I said I would listen and I have. I said I would work through these important reports and I have. I said I would take action and I am taking action. The first of those actions is to put communities back at the centre of the Murray-Darling Basin. So I'm so pleased to welcome the new chairman of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority here today. So Angus stepped into the role at a critical time for the organisation and for the community. The trust deficit needs repair and no one is better placed to mend that gap. It's a gap that all governments share. All of us have a role in water and we all need to step up and repair relationships with basin communities. The fact will always remain that it is a shared river system. It's the easiest thing in the world to label people upstream as thieves and people downstream as wasters. However, in a single connected system, with its shared and limited water resources. We need to be better to ourselves than that. Caring for one another and the recognition that we are an Australian nation and not just battling our neighbours is something I know Sir Angus will bring to the table for all of us. And our government is here to make sure that rural and regional Australia is front and centre of our national recovery plan. And my announcements today are just part of the economic recovery plan for regional Australia. That's because rural and regional Australia is a cornerstone of this country's economic recovery and a cornerstone of Australian life. So today I'm pleased to announce as part of the investment package, four actions to keep our communities and rivers healthy. $34 million to extend the Murray-Darling Basin Economic Development Fund. This important grant provides support for those communities hit by water recovery to create a better and more diverse economic future. Last week, I travelled through northern and northwest New South Wales on my way to Canberra and I announced $15 million to support projects as diverse as building the micro avatar, restoring the paddle steamer, and upgrading regional airport facilities. Importantly, they are ideas generated and supported by communities that create jobs, and these jobs are local jobs. I'm also announcing $20 million for community driven projects that improve the health of rivers and wetlands while supporting economic development and jobs. And I want to stress river health is not just about river flows. It's about all the things that contribute to healthy rivers, like erosion control. It's about cold water pollution. It's about getting rid of weeds and carp and other pests. It's about protecting wetlands for birds and fish. Those complementary measures that move us away from arguing about the numbers and towards a focus on outcomes. Now, local people know what's best for their stretch of the river, particularly for those river needs. So we're going to continue to listen to and support their ideas and create on the ground jobs and partnerships with communities. There's $3 million to employ 20 new indigenous river rangers to care for river country across the basin. So that's 20 new jobs for Aboriginal people across the basin. Their knowledge and connection to country is invaluable in managing and restoring rivers while providing real jobs in rural and remote areas. There's another seven and a half million to make sure we're gathering the right information to improve our monitoring of the social, economic, and environmental conditions. This will help build key evidence bases for government decisions and support industry adaptation. This is a win-win because it's about further building trust and evidence. While we talk about transparency and accountability, all governments must do more when it comes to improving accountability and transparency. Another key action to improve trust. Now, one way we're addressing this is through establishing a single point of truth when it comes to accurate and up-to-date water information. Having a one-stop shop for information on water storages, in-stream flow rates, where environmental water is being used, water allocations, ownership, trade information. Well, that seems like a no-brainer. But to make this sort of information available to the community will take the cooperation of the state. Now, I haven't touched on the centrality of their role yet, but I will. 
Our government has already committed 25 million to improve metering in the northern part of the basin. But at the moment, there just isn't the trained workforce to install and maintain the meters, undermining our investment and confidence in the compliance framework. So we're changing that, we're creating more jobs, especially for Aboriginal people to install meters, while we also develop the telemetry market so that readings are available to state regulators easily and cost effectively. Which brings me to compliance. Another critical component to restoring people's faith in governments is ensuring that compliance approaches are transparent, independent and of the highest standard. So today I announce my intention to work with Basin Water Ministers to establish an Inspector General of Water Compliance. To do this, I'll merge the MDBA's compliance functions with the existing Interim Inspector General of Murray-Darling Basin Water Resources to consolidate the Commonwealth's regulatory responsibilities when it comes to water in the basin. In effect, this will split the MDBA by separating its compliance office into a separate institution. And as some of my national colleagues have said on a number of occasions, this will put to bed any perception that the MDBA is structured in a way it can mark its own homework. It's important that we can put forward arrangements that communities will be able to have confidence in. And this move directly responds to the recommendations raised by the Productivity Commission in its five-year assessment of the Basin Plan, completed in 2018. The recent ACCC interim report into water markets also raises the need for a better compliance regime. To ensure the new statutory office has the resources to hit the ground running and hold a mirror up to the state, we are committing $30 million to improve compliance and will bolster that investment with another 8 million to make the administrative and legislative changes that are needed to establish and support the new Inspector General. This is delivering on the process COAG started last year. And I intend to cl consult closely with the Basin Water Ministers on the final design of the office. What I can say though, like the MDBA's existing regionalised approach with offices in towns across the basin, the offices of the new Inspector General of Water Compliance will also be located out in regional communities that they will need to work with. We're also continuing to progress business cases for the development of new hydrological models for the MDBA. This will make sure the modelling necessary for the implementation and evaluation of the basin plan is state of the art. The current models are at the catchment level rather than the basin level, and they're 20 years old. In some cases, these are models and systems developed at a time before the internet became a significant part of people's lives. All Australians deserve to have confidence in the systems that underpin the assessments of the Basin Plan. The Basin Plan and water reform is, after all, a $13 billion investment in their name. Now, in regards to the states, I want to take this opportunity to call for renewed cooperation from the states and territories that are participants in the plan. Since taking on the job, I've been impressed by water ministers of different political stripes, offering their considerable experience and knowledge to me as the new federal minister. However, I stress, people on the ground are seeking leadership from us. And I wanna state here and now, I intend to make tangible progress on finalising the implementation of this reform in a way that protects the interests of our communities. We are all equal partners in this water reform process. Again, returning to John Howard's words in 2007, criticism of the management of the Murray-Darling Basin is often seen as the Commonwealth blaming the state or one state blaming another. So let me be very clear. People on the Crown don't care. They don't care which government is responsible. They only care that it is fixed, that it is sensible and that it works. So implementation of critical parts of the plan and achievement of the commitments of governments remain well behind schedule. In particular, Projects to avoid another 605 gigalitres of water recovery from communities are at serious risk of failure. I do look to the states to think adaptively, to meet their commitments, and to act to deliver the projects that will provide the certainty communities deserve. In total, the government has $4 billion available for projects in the Murray-Darling Basin. And my priority is to get that money out onto the ground, creating jobs, supporting communities, and avoiding any need for additional water purchases in the future. We cannot fail in this. We cannot fail in this because I will not take more water from our communities than is already required. So when it comes to the Weezer report, and I've already acknowledged Sally Farrier, and she's online from Melbourne, given the COVID restrictions, and I'm sure I speak for all of us when I wish her and all the Victorians on the call well at this difficult time. 
The Water for the Environment Special Account Review, which she led as chair, says very clearly, we will not recover the 450 gigalitres by 30 June 2024. Can I thank her and the panel for that frank advice? But that advice is a warning to all basin governments. We need to adjust our approaches. We need to redouble our efforts because failure just prolongs the uncertainty that basin communities face. Now our communities deserve our best efforts to meet our goals. And I'm not about to call an early end of the game just because we're behind on the scoreboard. My expectation is that my department and the states step up and minimise the gap between our goals and our landing point. There is plenty of time between now and 2024 to consider our progress and refresh our thinking. Now is not the time to give up. So we do need to keep existing programs on track. Our government is extending a helping hand to get communities and the states over the line. We remain committed to the 450 gigalitres and acknowledge that we need to approach it differently. But this report makes clear that we are very much behind schedule. We don't want to see river health and downstream communities go backwards because of delays in the recovery of the 450. So today I announced the Murray-Darling Sustainable Riverland Program that will make $38 million available for downstream river health projects. These projects will help mitigate the delays in progress towards the target of an additional 450 gigalitres of water for downstream river health. I know there are those upstream that may see this example as evidence that the plan is about sending good water out to sea, but it isn't. The Murray mouth is only one indicator of many. There is much we need to do upstream as well. And as I've said already, the Murray-Darling Basin is a connected system that supports us all. And we need to be better to ourselves and continue in the pursuit of upstream and downstream battle. This is a national asset and we will find collective solutions. So we are committed to working with the states to squeeze more water efficiencies out of existing projects. And here, we're enlisting the help of the National Water Grid Authority to identify ways that we can make the 36 projects nominated by the states to save 605 gigalitres of water recovery work harder. The National Water Grid Authority will also provide greater oversight and regular reporting about risks, blockages and possible interventions to keep projects on track. This includes projects that will enable us to better manage water in and around environmental assets to protect their integrity. The National Water Grid will also help identify the all farm water infrastructure projects that will reinvigorate progress against the 450 gigalitres without taking further water from irrigators. Now I'm advised by my department with a, a pivot to off-farm projects, 150 gigalitres of water savings are possible. And that there are over 50 proposals already on the table that could address water losses and recover 70 gigalitres of water quickly. And that is without touching an irrigator's license. Our government isn't making this additional investment simply on trust. I intend for a new national partnership arrangement to incentivise the states to accelerate their delivery timeframes for the project. The Commonwealth will help where it can to speed up inundation mapping and trials of different flow rates to give communities confidence to move ahead. We will help to prepare accelerated implementation plans for projects most at risk of not being delivered by 2024. But ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, our government is offering a comprehensive response through this investment package on behalf of all Australians. I've set out the government's commitment by announcing a range of new practical initiatives to put communities back at the centre of water reform in the Murray-Darling Basin. And it's also a reset, a chance to start with a clean slate and make sure we listen to communities. It is a change from deciding things while sitting behind a desk in Canberra. For me, the Basin Plan is not about irrigation versus the environment. It's about investing in the communities that value and sustain both. It's about getting the right outcomes, not a simplistic focus on the numbers. Now, as I said, I was an electrician by trade, I'm an engineer by profession, a farmer at heart, and I know the stresses of running a business, and I know that water is critical to just about everything we do in regional Australia. It is in my nature to find solutions to problems, not to avoid them. Now, I know that what I've announced today will generate plenty of discussion among basin communities, but I believe it is an important step in addressing the issues and concern that they have raised with me. Now, in particular, I'd like to mention the contribution of my good friend and colleague, Senator Perrin Davey from New South Wales. She is a strong and knowledgeable advocate for her communities. And I have to say that knowledge has been invaluable in terms of this process. Finally, I'd like to restate the importance of the regions contained within the Murray-Darling Basin to our nation. 
these river communities are important. They are important to our economy and they are important to jobs. And the Murray-Darling Basin, our most iconic river system, is important and it is a national asset. It's why we as government are investing in the future and bringing communities back to the heart of the basin plan. And with that, can I say thank you, good afternoon, God bless and safe travel. Thanks, Minister. Now, I know you've agreed to answer some questions. We've had some people jump straight on the email after the media this morning around some of the things that you've been saying today. So we'll kick off with some of those. Uh, we also had a few questions sent in in advance of that, and we've had a heap online. So if we keep the answers short, we'll get through as many as we can. The first one's from Jameson Murphy, sorry, Jameson Murphy, the National Rural Affairs Reporter with Australian Community Media. And if the water buybacks that have been promised won't be legislated, then how can farm communities trust that government won't resort to those if the targets are not met through infrastructure efficiencies? Well, first and foremost, I unequivocally rule it out. Uh, I, I won't be, uh, and the Commonwealth won't be, uh, performing water buybacks at, a, at any point. Uh, that is from the Prime Minister down. This is a decision of the Coalition Government, of the Cabinet, and of all of my colleagues uh, which are in government. Terrific. So, Councillor Melissa Rebeck, who's Chair of the Region 6 MDA, who's online and also emailed a question. Is there a time limit on sustainable diversion limited adjustment mechanism projects? If New South Wales can't have its projects in place by June 21, and if you can't have buybacks, what else can we do? Well, well as I've said, this is about a shift. I mean, if we continue to do things which clearly haven't worked in the past, uh, we have some very clear reports on where we're headed. But as I've said, our intention is to achieve our goal. Uh, and I'm looking to shift those projects to all farm efficiencies. We have a number of projects out there which we can get going. Uh, and I'll be brutally frank, I have $4 billion in the Commonwealth account. Every single dollar of that I want to see in communities driving projects and driving jobs. Uh, in a post-COVID environment, every dollar is essential. Every job is an essential service. Every person I can get whether they're on a forklift or an excavator or a backhoe or a manufacturing workshop, uh, building fish ladders or pipeways, they are jobs for Australians and it's my intention to deliver. That leads beautifully into a question we had emailed in from Stephen Wentworth from Feeding the Future. A couple of years ago, a CSIRO report suggested building several dams across Northern Australia for irrigated agriculture. What's the federal government doing to make that happen? Because they could potentially be shovel ready projects to stimulate the economy. Well, as I've said, we're going to work closely with the new National Water Grid Authority under the Deputy Prime Minister, Michael McCormick and the Department of Infrastructure. Uh, I know there's been a number of announcements already about uh, dam projects, particularly lifting the height of walls, such as uh, a couple in New South Wales. In Queensland, I know the leader of the opposition, Deb Frecklington, has committed to a feasibility study on what they're calling Bradfield 2.0. And I think the Australian people recognise we need to look at those big infrastructure projects as part of the economic recovery. Now, whilst it's in other parts of my portfolio, I mean, that, that has to include a, a gas-fired recovery. It has to include a critical linking infrastructure in terms of roads and rail and other transport. It has to include significant investment from the Commonwealth and I'm very pleased the National Water Grid's been stood up. I think the opportunity for us to work with the National Water Grid in the future for the benefit of the Murray-Darling Basin is very, very strong. All right, a question from Andrew Miller from Australian Community Media. Why is it that vacancies on the Murray-Darling Basin Authority board remain unfilled nearly 12 months after expressions of interest were called for replacement? Uh, well, Pat, thanks for the question. And uh, once again, everything to do with the Murray-Darling Basin tends to be challenging. Uh, so there was a decision, my understanding, there was a decision taken by Basin Ministers uh, at a previous COAG uh, to run a different process. Uh, given the amount of change and the substantial pivot that I've announced today and about our process to focus on communities, uh, I thought it was important to make sure the balance across the MDBA board uh, did include all states. And uh, now I've appointed Sir Angus Houston as the chair I think Sir Angus comes uh, to the role uh, with a completely unbiased view, a person whose integrity is absolutely without question. Uh, and, and to be frank, when he's in the room, no one wants to talk to me. They all want to talk to Sir Angus. Uh, but we are making further progress on the remaining positions uh, on the board in consultation with State Secretary. Right. Now, we've had quite a few questions about First Nations people. 
There's one here from Kingsley Abdullah from Mildren. How does the announcements that you've made today benefit First Nation people? Well, as I've said, we're going to stand up four groups of Indigenous rangers across the basin. Uh, we've made a financial commitment to make that happen. Uh, we'd already committed some $40 million uh, to assisting uh, Indigenous communities previously. Uh, and once again, we'll continue to consult and work closely with all members of the basin community uh, over the, the coming weeks and months. Uh, this is an important announcement in terms of our focus on all communities. And another question from Fred Hooper, the chairperson of the Northern Basin Aboriginal Nations. He attended a meeting of a committee with, that was read, led by Robbie Sefton, and he's talking about it being a European drought that's being recovered, being experienced, because he got a feed from the side of the road in January. His question, why are we not investing in crops that need less water rather than just putting money into water thirsty crops? Australia absolutely leads the way uh, when it comes to water efficiency. Uh, we only have to look at what our growers and producers actually produce for the nation right across the country. Uh, I'm a former farmer, a cane farmer and broken down sweet potatoes on occasion. Every single drop is important. Uh, every teaspoon is, is tracked. Uh, we've done enormous amounts of work, particularly around research, uh, whether you look at rice or cotton or other broadacre crops in terms of their production efficiency versus how much water is required to produce that crop, uh, and we'll continue to be focused on that. So I think there's been enormous changes uh, over recent years in terms of efficiency and productivity per megalitre per hectare, uh, and I think that, that will continue because it's in the interest of everyone. A question here from Jono Lanouz. Of the off-farm infrastructure projects that you're talking about that can recover 150 gigalitres, what are they? Because surely all the low-hanging fruit's already been plucked. Well, that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, and I, I absolutely agree, the low hanging fruit has been picked. That's why we're, we're at 95% in terms of the recovery. So the last five will obviously be challenging, but we are working closely with the states and territories. Uh, the money I've announced for South Australia today uh, in terms of a focus on the environment and river health uh, will be allocated to a number of projects uh, around Randmark uh, in terms of water management for some particular locks and fishways. And I think this is a really good point that I, I want to reinforce. Uh, looking after the environment is not, not just about the water recovery piece. Uh, it's not much point pouring new fish into the top end of the river if you lose them to river pumps 10 k's away. So I think we need to be more focused on those practical outcomes. Uh, it's no good revegetating river banks if you've got too many feral pigs that then come and tear it up again a week later. So I, I'll continue to be focused on the practical outcomes. Uh, there is a long list of projects which will be assessed. Uh, but my focus will be on ensuring that my department gets out there and gets these projects underway. A question from Katie McBride. You just mentioned state governments there and in your speech as well. South Australian Water Minister David Spears was on ABC Country Hour yesterday reaffirming, reaffirming the importance of voluntary buybacks and insisting they remain on the table. Does today's announcement have the support of the South Australian government considering they'll be most adversely affected by a slower recovery? Uh, well, as I've said, given that we have recognised delays in the 450, we've committed roughly $38 million for, economic, for environmental projects in the, in the lower part of the river. Uh, they will benefit directly South Australia and river, and river Health. I've spoken to all of my ministerial counterparts overnight about today's announcement, and I'll continue to work very closely with each of them. Uh, once again, I'll, I'll reinforce the point I made earlier. The people on the ground expect us to work together to get outcomes for them, uh, and that has never been more certain or more obvious than it is in the grips of the pandemic that currently runs around the world and is directly affecting Australia and its economy. There's a group of local governments and other organisations calling for a cooperative research centre to tackle climate, water and environmental threats to the Murray-Darling Basin. What are your thoughts on that proposal? The overwhelming majority of CRCs uh, do, do sit with my colleague, uh, Karen Andrews, inside the manufacturing part of the portfolio. I mean, we will continue to take the best available science, uh, but the work that we're doing today is to very clearly and directly say that we are looking to put communities at the heart of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Uh, we're looking to invest in those communities and to ensure that we continue to work with them very closely as the final parts of the recovery piece come together. Uh, I think the communities have done a fantastic job uh, to get where we are now, but our focus needs to be on them.
Another question from Jameson Murphy from Australian Community Media. If the Inspector General powers aren't adequate and the Murray-Darling Basin Authority's powers have been stripped, how will you ensure enforcement powers are increased when they hand it over to the Inspector General and make sure there isn't an overall drop in enforcement? Oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, so what we'll do immediately, because the new Office of the Inspector General for Water Compliance uh, will need legislation to pass through both the House and the Senate to stand up that separate entity. So we will act immediately to stand up inside my existing department, uh, effectively the equivalent of the compliance office. Uh, those compliance officers will take with them the existing powers under the Murray-Darling Basin uh, Authority that they have now. Um, we'll be looking to expand uh, on that as we move into the new entity. So there are a number of steps in the process to form up the new Inspector General, uh, including a legislative process. I certainly look forward to bipartisan support uh, in terms of of the Parliament, the House of Representatives and the Senate. Uh, but once again, uh, this has been recommended by the Productivity Commission and we're taking action. All right, Dougal Bucknell from Quambone Station sent us in a question via email earlier this week. He wants to know if you'll release all eight Australian government solicited definitions of the Water Act. He asks how you can expect mum and dad farmers, and he is one of them, to abide by the law and know that you are abiding by the law if those laws aren't publicly released? Uh, well, once again, when it comes to compliance, uh, there are multiple levels uh, for all levels of government. Uh, at the Commonwealth level, we obviously have the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, uh, who is currently accrediting the water resource plans for New South Wales. And can I very publicly thank Melinda Pavey, uh, who told me she would deliver those plans within a particular time frame, and that's exactly what the New South Wales government has done. Uh, those WRPs are being assessed against the requirements of the plan. Once accredited, they very clearly set out the legal framework uh, from the Commonwealth and, of course, the state uh, provisions. Uh, but there are a number of areas in terms of enforcement which are state-based. Uh, they'll continue to be state-based. Uh, but I, you know, I certainly acknowledge the, the question and I'm happy to go and take that on notice and look more closely at it. All right. A question from Sophie Baldwin from Southern Riverina Irrigators. The allocation reliability is reduced from 84% to 48% over the last 20 years. How will your announcements today improve long-term reliability for those irrigators? Oh, well, that's a fantastic question. Uh, and once again, it's the important part of the pivot. If we shift to all farm efficiency projects, we'll still get the recovery without that direct impact of water buybacks into smaller communities. Uh, in terms of the allocation and the water management, as I'm sure all the people on the call know, incredibly complicated. It varies across the basin depending on which location, which valley, which state, which level of government. Uh, and you know, it's a very complex issue. But if we look at uh, market trading and water trading as, as one part, uh, the ACCC interim report, I think very clearly states that there is a regulatory piece that needs to be improved. Uh, I look forward to receiving that report with the treasurer later in the year. And we will of course uh, act on those recommendations uh, if the ACCC identifies there's a problem. So I think there's a range of things that can be done uh, around trading, around allocation. Uh, unfortunately, as I've said during the speech, uh, inflows in recent years have been much lower. I mean, that, that's a direct correlation with how much rain there's been, uh, but the season does look much more promising. Uh, I certainly note that there's been an increase in allocation across most of the basin in the last couple of weeks. A question from Michael Young. You said you wanted to make the plan more adaptive. With the exception of buybacks, what are the other options that are on the table? Uh, well, as I said, we're going to move to all farm efficiencies in terms of the 450. Uh, we're going to add in the National Water Grid Authority uh, as an entity that can certainly help with very large projects, particularly whether they're storage or improvements in storage capacity. That helps with reliability of supply for water for downstream users. Uh, there's a lot of work being done in terms of actual practical environmental outcomes. And $234 million of Commonwealth commitment today is a significant and substantial investment. And that's on top of, it was a, 14, a $13 billion commitment all up. Um, there's $9 billion already allocated and there's three, uh, $4 billion to go. Every single one of those dollars, in my view, will drive jobs and my, I intend to get that delivered. And that may have answered the question from Beverly Smiles about what the Australian taxpayer has received for their $13 billion investment into addressing over-allocation, causing water and wetland degradation? Well, I think we're, we're at 95% in terms of the recovery challenge. I think there's been enormous improvements in the health of the river. Uh, we only have to look at uh, salt levels, particularly in the lower, the lower areas of the system. 
Are we only have to look at asset sulfate stalls and how they've been managed? Are we look at the massive improvement uh, and we look at the Narran Lakes, it's a great example. I mean, there was a lot of noise about the water that was uh, purchased for that environmental purpose. Some 70 gigalitres, is my understanding, has recently run into the Narran Lakes, which has been a great outcome in terms of the environment in that part of the basin. Uh, and we'll continue to do that. So this is about striking an effective balance. Uh, that's the commitment I've made when I took up the job and I'll continue to do that. All right, a question here that's probably a bit beyond my ability in this. Terry Corns asks, can you explain the 95% recovery? If the target's 3,200 gigalitres, we've only recovered 2,100 gigalitres. We're still relying on the unrecovered 605 gigalitres plus the 450 gigalitres to make up the full recovery. Terry's calculations show we're only 65% there. So where are you getting the 95% recovery figure from? Well, I don't mean to be flippant, but that's the advice I've been provided, uh, and, and I think it's accurate. So uh, it was just over 2,000, uh, which, which is the, the prime target. There was obviously adjustments uh, for the 450 and the 605, which are being delivered in different ways. Uh, and what, once again, I, I want to very clearly rule out further buyback. I want to very clearly say that we are pivoting to off-farm efficiency. I think there is um, there's more to be done. Uh, and as one of your previous questioners pointed, pointed out, all right, this is the pointy end of the pointy end of the most difficult. Uh, so whilst it's challenging, uh, I look forward to working with communities to deliver what we said we would. Uh, the, the goal is still there. Uh, and I'd much rather be taking action than spending time having a fight in Canberra with the Senate and the House of Representatives over a policy change that may or may not get through in a long period of time. So it's about acting uh, in the interest of the people in the basin. It's about re returning the focus to communities. Uh, it's about ensuring that we can have confidence for all users right across the basin that the Commonwealth is continuing to take a balanced approach. All right, we have time for just one more question, Minister. Natalie Ackers has asked how the government policy of no buybacks protecting farmers is going to happen when there's a change of government or be protected. Uh, look, it's a very good question. And I just, I want to make a point very clearly. Uh, no government can tie a future government in terms of legislation. Uh, if there were to be a change of government and that government controls the House and the Senate and they make changes to the existing legislation, well, that would be up to them. Uh, there's no way for us uh, as the current government to ensure or bind the future government in terms of its decision. Uh, what I'm saying very clearly as the Federal Water Minister is that there will be no further buyback. All right, we have gotten through a lot of questions there. Minister, thank you so much for keeping them short. I have to pull it up there. Apologies to everyone who had questions sent in or submitted today that we didn't get to. Thanks for joining us today and have a great weekend.